my presentation is about startups, about hardware startups. Um, we're an investment company. We've done over 200 investments over the past six years. And what I'm going to share here are some lessons we learned about how to build startups more effectively. And uh, hopefully that will help some of you uh, take your company to the next step. So, um, I have a lot of examples I'm going to share in this presentation, most of them not related to photography, but I hope will give you ideas about how you can apply that to your industry. Uh, very quickly about our fund, so uh, our fund is named SOSB, it's a $400 million fund. Uh, we invest mostly in prototype stage companies all around the world. We've done about 700 investments and our spe specialty is deep tech, so we have programs uh, with most long hands-on support for hardware startups and also for life sciences and other type of technologies. Hacks is the hardware program of SOXV. Uh, we started five years, six years ago now. Uh, we focus on hardware. We invest at the early prototype, so things coming out of the lab or coming out of workshop. Uh, we cover a lot of different sectors from industry, enterprise, health tech, and consumer. And we've done about 200 investments over the past six years. We have offices in Shenzhen, China. Um, you probably can imagine why. Uh, mostly because the entire electronic supply chain is based there. And also in San Francisco to help with fundraising, partnerships, and other things. In our Shenzhen office, we have about 30 staff that are here to help on every aspect of product and company building, ranging from sourcing, manufacturing, electronics expertise, mechanical design, industrial design, marketing, PR, all sorts of skills that very technical founders typically don't have and need to acquire very quickly. Quickly about myself, I'm an engineer. I heard it was kind of important to say in Germany, so I'm an engineer. Uh, I worked in telecom, I used to run a consulting company, I worked in gaming, and since uh, five years ago I joined Hax to work on hardware investments. Uh, I lived for a really long time, about uh, 18 years, actually in uh, China, in Japan, Korea, and also in Silicon Valley. So I'm quite familiar with different ecosystems. I'm a writer on technology, on startups, for a number of publications, and also uh, give talks about what we do at Max and other things uh, around the world. So, uh, apologies to vegetarians here, um, but uh, I thought about how to talk about building startups to people who come from really strong technology background and might not have um, the, the usual like startup vibe that we, we see when we're in Silicon Valley. So I thought, okay, okay, let's take this very simple example. Let's take a steak, hamburger, and uh, let's figure out what can you do with that. So it's kind of, let's do a startup. You have some imagery technology company, and you want to do a startup. So Jenny to you, what we look at as investors, we look at four things. It's very classic, we look at the team, we look at the technology, particularly whether the technology is hard to do and defensible. We look at whether you're part of a trend, if there's some macro trend that is pushing an industry in a particular direction, it's much easier to exist as a startup versus when you try to create a new market out of the blue. Um, the so the timing also matters. Looking more closely at the team, typically founders have a very strong vision of what they want to do, they have strong technology, but they don't have so much capabilities in execution, it means actually building a product beyond the lab, and also communicating the value proposition. And that's something that we see also in the startups we invest in, typically they're quite, actually quite weak at uh, organization and at messaging and making the message clear to the right audience. And it's, uh, it's actually quite important thing to do. So you start to build prototype. The first prototype takes you about that much of the way and then you have still a lot of work to do. You have to make a lot of iterations. Depending on where you are, making those iterations can take a lot of time and a lot of money. I talked with founders all around the world. I talked with founders in Germany. I was in Copenhagen recently. I was um, based in Paris these days. They all struggle to find suppliers willing to work with them, not only at the right price, but also in the right time frame, or simply suppliers that are willing to just take their business because they're busy with some other things. I've talked recently with a, a company that found in France two suppliers only to able to help them with their prototype 
two months later, still nothing done. The problem is, once you have the basic technology working in the lab, you still have quite a lot of way to go to turn it into a product. And the speed of iteration is really, really important. And you can't go as fast as software if you don't have access to the right resources. So iterations, as you can see, you're not yet at the end, because then you need to turn your prototypes into a product. That means engaging with the supply chain, and that's another effort. Then, even if you do that, you barely have way uh, to creating a business, because you need to do your PR, you need to do sales, you need to do marketing. You need people to notice that the product is so, as amazing as you think it is. You need to handle logistics, you need to handle distribution, and then a few other things like recruiting, financing, and legal things. So when you have your first prototype, you're basically 10% of the way of building a business. Of course, it's the very important start of creating that company, but it's just the start. So how do you do everything else? Well, it depends how fast you can learn. You can learn from getting advice, getting advice from other founders, from experts, from industry people, investors sometimes. You can hire people. Some of the work you can outsource. Sometimes it's not a good idea to outsource because you want to keep some elements that are core to your company and your technology internal. Also, if you outsource things like supply chain management, you're actually not in touch with the people making your product. You don't see the machines making your product. And it's a little bit like you're a chef and you're trying to cook a new dish and you know you should be you know next to the pot and you know tasting it and instead you're phoning in and you're asking somebody in the kitchen is it too salty and that's the problem we see with people who try to create new products far away from their supply chain another important aspect for creating startups is how you think about the resources you need and if you separate the different functions, you have the core R&D, you have the prototyping, production, customers, and funding. And each of those functions doesn't need to be in the same place. You could do your R&D in Germany, you could do your prototyping somewhere else, like Shenzhen, in production. Your customers are not necessarily here, and the funding could also come from somewhere else. So as founders of technology companies, you have to think very globally where the right resources are and how to access them. So our model is basically that. We work with companies from all around the world. Among the 200 companies we invested in, about half are in North America, a quarter in Europe, a quarter in Asia, with the Chinese share growing very fast. We bring teams to Shenzhen very early on so that they can prototype a lot faster and a lot cheaper as well and then engage with the supply chain to prepare production. Save them a lot of time, save them a lot of money. They discover new possibilities uh, thanks to the exposure to giant electronics markets and many, many factories. Customers could be in your home country as a pilot and then could be a large market like the US and the funding likewise could be first where you are, where it's easier maybe to find the first investors and then somewhere else. Shenzhen, so I'll do a quick uh, round here. Anybody has been to Shenzhen? Raise your hand. So one, two, three, four, okay, out of not that many. Um, so Shenzhen, if you've been there, you know that it's a pretty special place. Well, first, it's a pretty modern place now. It's not like a you know old fishing village. Uh, it's pretty fancy. I have a lot of you know, skyscrapers and stuff. Um, but really, the most interesting aspect of Shenzhen is not how fancy it looks, but how fast it grows. It grows really at startup speed. The founders of startups we work with tell us that a week there is like a month anywhere else. The cost are huge advantage. The availability of skills is also really important. In a recent interview, the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, was asked why they don't manufacture the products in the US. And his answer was that Despite what people think, it's not about the cost, it's about skills. He was talking about experts in injection molding of plastics. He said, well, to do really new high-tech injection molding, you need really good experts. And in the US, if you take all the experts in the country, you can probably fit all of them in a big meeting room. If you go to China, you, need, you would need several stadiums. It's just the amount of expertise available, it's incredible. 
Another misconception about China is people think, oh, I'll go there when I scale, when I go from you know 1,000 products to maybe 100, 10,000, 100,000. Reality is that, well, first, if you wait that long, you're going to have to move an entire supply chain from one place to another right at the moment you need to scale. So you don't have a lot of margin for error. Every error is going to cost you. Are going to have a cost multiplied by the number you need to make. Reality is that in Shenzhen we have a number of companies, particularly those making complex products, that start with just one product, very true robotics. They make one robot, and then they make two, and then they make ten, and then they make a hundred. This is a little drawing picture of uh, an area of Shenzhen named uh, Huachang Bay, which is the electronics. Market. So this big components market, the largest in the world. Some of you have been to Tokyo, to Akihabara, the electronics town. That's about 20 times the size of Tokyo's electronic town. And you have dozens of buildings with hundreds of shops selling all sorts of components that are directly tied to suppliers and factories. Our office, as you can see, is right in the middle. So you have literally downstairs and in all around lots and lots of stores. Initially, you can browse, discover a lot of things you don't know, and then quickly, you can just use that to get delivered things super fast. You can get components, same day delivery, you can get 3D prints, next day CNC machining, PCBs, all really, really fast. But there's another way to build startups rather than start with technology. The other way is to start with customers. And it happens less uh, when you work with people coming from out of labs because they typically have a technology and they're looking for applications. But in some cases, people come from an industry and they know a problem and they validate the problem and then they try to find how to solve it. And it's really important because if you have a technology and you're not sure who's the customers, it's actually quite difficult to figure it out. Whereas if you know the customer, then you can fig figure out in you know, a different approach to solve the problem. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, the lead startup method. Um, one of the kind of founding fathers of that is named Steve Blank. He's an entrepreneur who's turned into kind of an academic, academic who helped create a support program for scientists and engineers to transition from lab to market. It's a program called ICOR. It's now implemented in dozens of universities and research centers in the US. And it's a program centered around something called customer discovery, which basically forces founders to get in front of customers to discuss the problem. Not to try to sell their solution, but to really figure out if the problem is really there and what kind of other solution exists at the moment. So the kind of key phrase is get out of the building and talk to 100 customers. In seven weeks, you identify knowledge gaps on the best path forward. The startups we met and we invested in that came out of this program had a radical difference in terms of understanding their customers compared to other companies we work with. So I highly recommend it if you get a chance to even get familiar with the method. Uh, so earlier I showed a little camera and a bunch of prototypes. Actually it's a company we invested in, one of the few in the, the kind of imaging category. They, it's a team of uh, Silicon Valley um, creators who wanted to make initially a hackable camera where you could put different software and all sorts of processing on you know be able to make a smart camera essentially. It was kind of a cool idea, we liked the team, it was about five years ago. And uh, they tried to put it on Kickstarter as a consumer camera. And the result actually wasn't that great. They raised $70,000, which for us uh, is very low. Uh, we've run over 100, 100 campaigns, a dozen of them over a million dollars. So anything below $100,000 is bad news. Um, and they discovered that a $200 hipster hackable camera was not exactly everybody's dream. Their target was not to make it $200, their target was to make it $50, but they just couldn't because there was no interesting platform to do it. So that gave them the second idea, which was to create a much cheaper platform on which people could create new products, which they did. And they managed to create the world's first $9 computer that covered in many media. It was really unprecedented. It's a tiny computer, it's not a powerful computer, but it does a lot of work. They went back to Kickstarter, raised $2 million, raised VC funding. 
sounds like good news. Problem is, a few years pass, and they really tried to find a market for their new product, which seemed more promising, and they found some kind of a niche, but still didn't find any market. So the company not closed down. And that's an example of a company that went from one idea to figure out another idea, but yet was still looking for a market. And it's very difficult to create one. They also figured out that they had issues in pricing, they had issues in purchasing, the margins were really thin, and issues in, with distribution. Those are some quotes of people who commented after they announced they closed down. People said, great engineers don't tend to make great business people. Um, hipsters at an engineer's game. So you need to think of the business, not just the technology. So now we are at uh, photography on imaging uh, trade show, but I thought you know much more than me about that sector, so I'm going to talk to you about another sector, and we'll try to see if there's maybe some parallels. I'm going to tell you about audio. You probably know that guy, Sony Walkman, first portable audio, then Bluetooth audio, a company named Jobon, raised almost a billion dollars, and eventually, went all the way to Ikea to basically be killed by commoditization. And that's one of the big risks when you create a company, is how quickly are you going to get commoditized? Jobon didn't manage to reinvent itself quickly enough with new product, and now for $50 you have a Bluetooth speaker at Ikea. Then you had some other novelty, uh, Dr. Dre, design, big bass. Then you had noise cancelling. But now noise cancelling has become also a commodity. So what's the next thing? Okay, wireless, got the airports. Also on another branch you have smart speakers, so things that can just emit sound, but can collect the sound and can interact, and that's a big trend. But this is also commoditizing. Uh, there's maybe some of you are familiar with the company uh, from China named Xiaomi. They make smartphones. You might have my smartphone here recording. Um, and they also distribute a lot of other products. And we call Xiaomiization when Xiaomi starts to do a particular product just to do it for much cheaper, good quality, and then basically destroy the market. And that's also happening with those voice assistants and smart speakers. Uh, this is the results of uh, smart speakers shipping, shipping from the first quarter of this year. Uh, Amazon and Google still dominate, but you can see Alibaba, Xiaomi, mostly in China, are also um, shipping their own. All those are Chinese products on the side. By Xiaomi, uh, I think this is the Tencent one, and that's the Alibaba. So this is also commoditizing. So how do you stand out with different technologies on what could be new in the audio sector? So some companies have tried with different ways. Uh, this company I met recently um, called Soundbox, that decided to make the loudest speaker ever. Um, really sturdy so that you know it goes in the snow, it goes in the sand, can splash it with beer, can take it to a party. So that's kind of a niche. They went on Kickstarter and they seem to be doing quite well. It's not necessarily like venture scale business, but that's a differentiation. Another company you might have heard of called Devialet from France um, has interesting technology where they kind of compress the sound and they manage to get really high volume and high fidelity in a small volume. Um, and they raised over $160 million. So that's another way. Uh, it's kind of premium product. So what next? Uh, so I talked about burgers and meat, so it looks like the next wave in meat is to have meat without meat, or meat in a lab, uh, or meat from insects, uh, all sorts of things. Well, the next wave we see in uh, technology, particularly consumer and also health, is, is personalized products and specialized products. For example, this is a company I've uh, invested in from Canada called Rebels. What they created are uh, earbuds that shape to your ear. So they're soft at the beginning, you place them, and then you press a button, and then they solidify, so you can have custom-shaped earbuds just for you in one minute. So the company actually got acquired by Logitech pretty early on, a bit too early for us investors to be happy, but the founders, you know, they bought, they bought houses and they're happy. Um, so that's an example of aftermarket customization. 
because it's very difficult to do a million different products from the same factory line. So if you can customize aftermarket, you have a better shot. Uh, they were actually the biggest Kickstarter from Canada. They raised $2.5 million at the time. Interestingly, that technology came from dentistry. It's a gel that solidifies with UV light. So what they send in their photosensitive gel is a pulse of UV light to basically curate the gel in your ear inside a, a sleeve of silicone. Here's another product, you know that guy, he does like all those unboxing videos, he's kind of crazy guy on YouTube. 